welcome back to Combat Mission Battle for Normandy for the ninth mission in the Scottish Corridor campaign. In the last one, our 2nd Argyle and Southern Highlanders pretty comprehensively repelled a German infantry attack. Now they're back with mortar and tank support. This is going to be interesting because we're fighting on the same map, just with the edges pulled out a bit. So up front in the centre we have the battlefield we just fought over, the Bacarge, Wheatfields, Orchard, edge of the village and that reverse slope. On the left we have more of Gavras and some woods. To the rear we have the slope down to the wooded banks of the Odon, two bridges across it and then the slope out of the river valley on the other side with a few more Bacarge lined fields. The main aim here is to maintain control over the Odon bridges, that's objective donjon worth 500 points. Forward of Don John on the edge of the village, there's also Objective Gatehouse, which is worth 200 points. And there are another 500 on the table for destroying enemy forces, and the usual 100 bonus for keeping friendly casualties below 20%. There are 60 minutes on the clock, so in a nutshell, I have to keep the Germans away from the two bridges for an hour, and do as much damage as I can. This may be more difficult than it seems. The briefing indicates that the enemy not only is coming to this party in battalion strength with Panzer fours and heavy mortars, but that they're attacking on both sides of the river. They've already apparently infiltrated troops into the top end of Gavras, so there's a potential avenue of approach there as well. In other words, the plan I used last time is probably not going to cut it. I do have a larger force though. Starting out on the map is B Company plus C Company's 14 platoon, backed up by two six-pounders on the high ground in the back and a scout section from the battalion support company, plus a pair of MMG carriers armed with Vickers. From 15 minutes on, the rest of C Company will appear as reinforcements. This is an interesting slant on things. The briefing indicates that they're already on the map, just not participating yet. I think they're going to pop up around Objective Donjon because I can't deploy anything there, but I don't know. I also have a lot of fire support to back the infantry up. After five minutes, the battalion mortars will be available. Two sections of two three-inch mortars, plus a four-gun troop of 25 pounders. That's nice, and I have three target reference points to help call artillery in amongst these short sightlines, but it gets better. After 15 minutes, a 4-2 tube of 4.2-inch heavy mortars will come online and an entire battery of Priest self-propelled guns. That's 8 105mm guns with over 500 rounds of ammunition in total. An incredibly powerful asset on a map this small. So powerful, in fact, I'm tempted to build my plan around it. There are limited avenues of approach for the German armour due to the Bacage, and all the routes coming in from the far side of the Odon converge on Objective Gatehouse. This makes that junction a natural place for the Germans to focus their attack before trying to push down the valley side to the actual bridges. If I can focus my defence there, I can potentially block and fix the enemy on top of a target reference point in position to be obliterated by the artillery. Of course, it's not that simple. Although the walls and bacage will block German tanks, most of the bacage has little gaps and is permeable to infantry, so focusing entirely on Objective Gatehouse would run the risk of being outflanked. Naturally, I want to separate the enemy infantry from their armour and kick off a repeat of the last mission, gunning them down as they approach over the fields, but a lot of my success earlier was due to those unmolested flanking units. With more Germans in the fight over a wider front, it's a lot less likely that I'm going to be able to get away with that. So in the end, I'm not particularly happy. I've deployed B Company as a first line, pretty much corresponding to the defence of the last mission. 10 Platoon is in the village, defending the left flank and the main road. 11 Platoon is dug in in the centre at the bottom of the wheat fields, with the Company HQ Essex nearby in the San Nicholas firm and 12 platoon is dug in on the right. C company is my reserve, most of it is going to appear as reinforcements, hopefully somewhere safe, but 14 platoon is standing by on my second line position, the lane, as the game starts. The six pounders are in the back on the high ground, where they have surprisingly good views of the main road and the right field, as well as being in position to cover the single potential armour avenue of approach, 
on their side of the river. Out in front, I've got the Scout Carriers, B Company Sniper Team, and some Scouts from Ten Platoon acting as an outpost line. Like I say, I don't like this deployment. Some opportunities might pop up to gain a local advantage, but I'm worried that this is going to turn into a strength on strength slugging match. As anticipated by the briefing, the Germans kick things off with their heavy mortars, hitting the empty buildings on the right of the main road and the less empty right edge of the orchard. 12th platoon immediately take some casualties before they get their heads down. I should have ordered them to hide at the start of the mission, but I forgot. But despite the foxholes, it's a pretty intense barrage and they're right underneath it. They're also first in line to make contact. Just like the last mission, the Germans look to be moving on the right first. Most of 12th platoon is pinned down by the mortars, but I did set up one of the scout carriers to cover the entrance to the right field from the centre. Unlike the last mission, however, the Germans have brought a tank with them. The carrier never spots it and is quickly taken out. 12th platoon's Piet is cowering in a foxhole, but one of the six pounders in the back makes the spot. It takes them a couple of shots to get their iron, but they manage to score a penetration on the front hull. This prompts the crew to bail and the six pounder finishes the tank off next turn. There's still plenty of infantry in that field though, and although the enemy mortars have stopped, 12th platoon really isn't in a good state to repel them. Again though, the Germans don't seem to be attacking down the lane, so I throw another flanking party into position. The scout section HQ, who have a peer with them, 12th platoon's reserve section, and coming up to reinforce them, one of the Vickers carriers. My first batch of off-map support has become available too, so I use the scouts to start calling in a slow 3-inch mortar mission to block enemy progress in the weak field. The body count is already starting to rack up. The enemy trying to cross the field are getting the same treatment they did last time, but then it all goes wrong. Ten minutes in, the flanking party is suddenly shot up from behind. A second German force has entered the map in the woods by the river, instantly rendering the far right position on the lane untenable. My troops scramble to get out of the line of fire. Luckily, although the scout section HQ loses its leader and is forced to pull back, they've managed to successfully call the mortars in, so at least that avenue of attack through the right field is blocked off for now. The enemy is pushing on the left as well though. I pulled my scouts in the village back after getting a wave of contacts, infantry advancing through the buildings and at least one armour contact heading for the main road. This resolves into a second Panzer IV, but does so just next to a target reference point at the top of the hill. These don't only serve as pre-established reference points for calling artillery, they also function as known aiming points for on-map assets. So the six-pounder covering the road spots the Panzer IV, quickly consults its range card, and then puts a round straight into it on the first try. A follow-up shot is enough to knock it out. Again though, that still leaves the German infantry who I'm not in contact with. I know they're there though, and that moving through the buildings and high walled compounds is going to slow them down and canalise them, so I call in a quick 3 inch mortar stonk to try and wear them down a bit. I'm really more worried about the far left, where I've got a section and Templeton's Bren team in the woods to stop any flanking attempts, but they never push that angle. Instead the enemy masses in the orchard just outside the gatehouse objective. There's a bit of a standoff. Neither side can see each other over the wall, there's no way to get through, and while I'm able to chuck a few hand grenades and 2 inch mortar bombs over, I have no idea if they actually do anything. My main problem on the left is actually coming from the centre. The enemy have moved up and occupied the buildings on the other side of the road up the slope, where they can spot and engage my troops in the T-shaped house in the front left of Objective Gatehouse. I have 10 platoons HQ, the section I detached the scouts from earlier, and the platoon peered in that building, and although they hand some casualties out, they also take some, especially from a Panzerschreck team that's gotten up into one of the attics. Just when everything seems about stable though, the Germans in the compound breach the wall in front of them. The enemy pioneers who storm through are quickly gunned down between 10th platoon's men and a Bren team from 11th platoon firing across the road, but they're already badly shaken up from being Panzerschrecht, still under fire, and worse, separated from the rest of their platoon by the high walls. Ten platoon's other two sections are on the left and in the compound behind them, 
positions from which they're simply not able to offer any meaningful support. It's in the air whether I'll be able to hold on to the T-shaped house. As bad as things are on the flanks though, they're worse in the centre, with less constricted terrain, no flanking opportunities at all, and worse, no coverage from the AT guns in the back, the centre was always going to have meat grinder potential. With fire support from the diagonal and the edge of the village, plus two Panzer IVs closing in, 11 Platoon clings onto its foxholes waiting for the order to move up to the Bacage and repel the assault. I give the order as the Germans make their advance, and things quickly escalate. Plenty of enemy soldiers fall in the wheat, just like last time, but 11 Platoon is rapidly shut down by MG fire from the village. The 25 pounders are coming in on the road and I'm frantically trying to adjust them right onto the buildings to gain some suppression effect and shut the fire support down, but there's not much else I can do. The first Panzer IV enters the left field from the diagonal, 11 Platoon's Piat misses overhead and, backed up by a second Panzer IV emerging from the village side, the enemy tank proceeds to drive right up the St. Nicholas. Here it's too close for the Piats, but is at least immobilised by grenades. It's given the Germans the space they need to get forward though. Enemy infantry starts to stack up on the Vakaj outside St. Nicholas tossing hand grenades into 11 Platoon's foxholes, while more have reached the hedgerow on the right and are engaging what's left of 12 Platoon. The attack in the right field has at least petered out, I'm not feeling any pressure from this side, and I decide to take a gamble on hooking around with one of the scout carriers. If it's clear, I can send the Vickers carrier around to the diagonal and maybe manage to enfilade the front of the orchard hedgerow. The scouts get into the right field from behind or right, but have the misfortune to drive straight over a German team that have gone to ground in the wheat. A couple of hand grenades and some point blank machine gun fire later, and it's clear that moving on this angle isn't an option. And all the while, the AT guns in the back are getting mortared, and the enemy force on the other side of the river, behind all the action in the village and the orchard, is slowly but surely making its way through the woods towards the bridges. I don't have time to worry about them now though. In the centre, 12 platoon falls. After a few minutes of point blank firefight through the hedgerow, they've not only suffered heavy casualties, but are clearly not in a state to fight back. I order those not already falling back to make a run for the lane, where 14 platoon is set up as a second line. Things don't look great. I have two platoons out of the fight at this point, and the enemy have all but overrun St. Nicholas, with the T-shaped house on the other side of the road potentially going to crumble under pressure at any moment. But all this just means that the enemy have gotten within range of the gatehouse target reference point. The priest battery opens fire on a 70 metre line through St. Nicholas, eight 105mm guns firing a couple of rounds a minute directly onto the strongest concentration of German troops. This is a full-on annihilating fire mission, the kind that I've been just waiting to dole out ever since starting the campaign. There's no hiding from it. Any German troops trapped underneath or trying to advance through it are simply going to be wiped out. Down in the Odon Valley, the rest of C Company has arrived and the two platoons are already moving out, one to block the enemy force advancing through the woods, who are currently under 3 inch mortar fire, and the other to the bottom of the main road where they can quickly move to support either front. On the left, 10 platoons men in the T-shaped house are still standing and 14 platoon is holding firm in the lane, engaged in a desultory exchange of fire with the Germans across the orchard from them. Things look like they've just about reached some level of stability again when the enemy plays their next card. A trail of light vehicle sound contacts appears at the other end of Gavras, quickly resolving into a quartet of half-tracks coming down the main road. This wouldn't be a problem if the six-pounder covering that road hadn't just been knocked out by a mortar hit. The second six-pounder team is already dragging their gun over, but they're not going to make it in time. Fearing a thunder run down to the bridges, I quickly scrape together everyone I have spare and throw them into positions along the road. But the Germans don't go for it. Instead, they try to reinforce their loose hold on San Nicholas. A command half-track leads the way, followed by a stumble. Naturally, the Piat team in the T-shaped house misses the Slash 3, despite it presenting a perfect target, but it doesn't last long. 
taking a couple of casualties to small arms fire as it tries to position itself in the gardens, the command half track reverses into the path of a 105mm shell and suffers a direct hit. A support half track goes in third but stalls on the corner and is destroyed by the reloaded Piet. A fourth vehicle makes it inside and joins the Stummel, but they're both knocked out by the relentless artillery. While this drama on the road has been playing out, the remaining mobile Panzer IV was knocked out by a Piet as it tried to enter the orchard. That, combined with a lack of infantry support coming with it, seems a solid indicator that the Germans have culminated on this front. To be sure, I start adjusting the 105s to cover the length of the entire hedgerow. Down in the valley, the infantry force by the river is still moving forward, albeit slowly. They haven't really made contact yet, so it's not clear how formidable a force they are, but they've been under machine gun, sniper and mortar fire pretty much since they arrived, and with 13 minutes to go, plus the 4.2 inch mortars heading their way, the enemy evidently decides they aren't going to get the job done. The Germans surrender, meaning the battle is a total victory for the Brits. It's certainly not been without cost. I've lost 66 dead and 48 wounded, as well as one man taken prisoner and six carriers knocked out. Most of those casualties were in 11 and 12 platoons trying to hold on to the orchard. They were the ones who fought the fight I was concerned about, the frontal strength on strength squaring off meat grinder that I ultimately wasn't able to avoid. By the time it was clear 12th platoon in particular needed to pull back, it was too late. But up until that point, it wasn't exactly certain. If I had been a bit snappier with some of the artillery and blocked or suppressed the German base of fire in the edge of the village, or that Piet had been on target, it could have gone differently. On the other side, the Germans have lost 179 dead and 84 wounded. A pretty chunky body count overall, mostly as a result of the artillery. Everywhere the enemy stacked up, by the high wall on the left and along the orchard bacage in the centre, there are literal piles of bodies, as well as scatterings in the wheat field and through the village. Even the riverbank force has had a rough time, despite never being the focus of my attentions. The enemy also lost three out of four Panzer IVs, with the fourth immobilised and all four of the half-tracks they committed to the fight. They never came close to the critical objective, Donjon, and although they dipped their toes into Objective Gatehouse a few times, they suffered heavy casualties in the process and were ultimately unable to take it. The one course of action that could have unpicked my entire defence, attacking down that lane in the back behind the orchard, was again something that the Germans never attempted. But that's it for this branch of the campaign. We're done with the remarkable exploits of the Second Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders in Operation Epsom. For the final segment, we're back with the Ninth Cameronians on the other side of the Odon, pushing down from Le Haut de Bosque towards Granville. Hope you all enjoyed this one. I'll catch you in the next video.